To continue in Paul's letter to the church in Colossae, and today I'll be reading from chapter 2, verses 8 through 23. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have an in, indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism, and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I don't know how many of you uh, go out after dark or up early before the sun comes up. Um, I'm more likely to be up early before the sun comes up, and that's if it's a cloudless sky, you can see the stars, and they are very beautiful. Uh, they do declore, declare the glory of God. And uh, human beings have been fascinated by the stars. Uh, we know from ancient writings uh, from China and the Middle East and other places People have been looking at the stars and studying them since ancient times. And then, of course, when the telescopes came along, wow, then you could really see a whole lot more. And I don't know if you've seen any of the images from that newest space telescope, the Webb telescope, but they are astounding, seeing the stars in the heaven declaring the glory of God. And yet, because we live in a fallen, sin-filled world, there are some people who do not appreciate the true purpose of the stars. And of course, the purpose of the stars is to glorify God, to declare the glory of God who created them. And some people for thousands of years, uh, all the way through today, misuse the stars. They believe that these uh, giant balls of combustible gas so many miles away from us have an influence on the events of our lives. We call that astrology. And very likely that was one of the things happening in the city of Colossae and affecting the Christians there. Um, 
They were Christians, they had gotten saved, they believed Jesus Christ came and on the cross died for their sins and they trusted him. But they were still pulled here and there by other ideas, other beliefs, other philosophies, and other old ways of thinking. And even today, some people read horoscopes and try and live their day by whatever advice is in them. Advice supposedly gleaned from the stars in the night sky and the travels of the planets around the sun. And as Paul continues his letter to the Colossians, he's trying to get them back to basics, if you will. To lay aside all that old stuff, and he wants them to remember that Jesus Christ is the absolute fullness of God. And they don't have to add anything to Jesus Christ. They don't have to consult the stars for their day-to-day -day decisions. Um, uh, if you go up to Fayetteville, there's this one place, uh, it's right before you turn up onto Skibo Road, and there's a, a sign there that says, Sister Anne, Reader and Advisor. And uh, whenever my wife can drive up that way, I'll say, I could be a reader and advisor. I'll read the Bible and give you some advice based on what God says in this. <laughs> uh, uh, but there were other things going on in the city of Colossae. Um, people still listening to pagan philosophers. Um, and Paul is saying, you know, the philosophy that's true is God's philosophy, God's wisdom. Um, some people were searching after ecstatic worship experiences in order to encounter the living God. Um, and uh, some people still want that today. And it's certainly a, a good thing to be uplifted in our worship. It's good to have, um, uh, uh, to be lifted toward the living God in our worship. Um, but having that uplifted feeling is not the most important thing. The most important thing is the encounter with the living God, which is what Christian worship is. Um, so you don't need to have an ecstatic experience to truly have encountered the living God. But some in Colossae said, oh man, you should try and do that. You don't have to excessively fast or deny themselves the ordinary good things of life in order to please God. Now, fasting can be a good spiritual discipline, uh, skipping a meal and spending that time in prayer rather than in eating. So fasting does have a good place, but there were some who were saying, no, you've really got to deny yourself. You've really got to uh, engage in what's called asceticism. Um, no fancy clothes, no fancy foods, uh, all of that. Um, and there is some good to be had in simple living, but when you take asceticism to the extreme, thinking you're going to please God by it, it's like, no, God is already pleased with you and loves you. And it appears that some there were worshiping angels. Now, angels are creatures. They were created by God, and they do God's work. Uh, in the Bible, we read how they often carried messages from God to people. And uh, we can be aware of the existence of angels. We know that they work for God, uh, but we don't worship them. That is forbidden to us. We worship the one living and true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and God alone. So that's Paul, what Paul is covering in this portion of his letter to the Colossians. Keep it simple, Jesus is enough. Paul reminds them that they had been dead, dead in their sins, and in our sinful condition, that's what it is, it's death. Now they have been raised to a new life in Jesus Christ, and the pledge of that new life is that they have been baptized. You know, we don't always have a baptism on Sunday morning, but every Sunday we have our baptismal font. And everybody can see it. Can you see it from wherever you're at? 
And that's a reminder, yeah, we are the baptized children of God, and we have been raised to a new life. God is at work in their baptisms. And baptism is not an empty sign. Baptism is an actual working of God's grace. <laughs> well, I was baptized at three weeks old, and now I'm 62 and a half, so God's been working on me for a while, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> Uh, the sacrament of baptism points beyond itself to greater realities. It's, it's not something empty. It's something where God's grace is really there and really active. Now, baptism's waters don't literally wash away sins or drown people, but um, the water of baptism points to the reality of the washing away of our sins, which is done by the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And the water of baptism also points to the reality of drowning, of dying to sin, and being raised up to new life. Um, and, and for those Christians who uh, have immersion baptism, um, that part of it is uh, are, are really powerful. They really see that. The sacrament of baptism does point God's dearly beloved people, and that's you, to the forgiveness of sins through Christ's saving death. Baptism points to the way that the Holy Spirit makes us more and more dead to sin and alive to holiness and righteousness. Well, Colossians chapter 2 especially points to that particular reality, being made alive to holiness and righteousness. In verse 12, Paul speaks of Jesus' followers being buried with Christ in baptism and raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. As Christ was raised, so we are raised, and yet again we will be raised when Christ comes for the second time. Now we human beings long for meaning. We want our lives to mean something. We want life to mean something. And we who follow Jesus Christ know that the meaning of life is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. To love God and to be loved by God is what life is to be all about. However sinful, fallen human beings look for meaning in myriad other ways other than in Jesus Christ. And our search for meaning is persistent, it is desperate, and it easily goes off in wrong directions. We easily drift toward ideas and philosophies that have their origin in human thinking and human speculating. Two public figures in the last year or so have made public pronouncements about what the meaning of life is. Uh, one was Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, and who has built that up as a big company and it connects people all over the world. And he came out uh, and said that the meaning of life is creativity. Human beings have a meaningful life when they're creating things. Well, that's, it's, it's good to create things. Um, you know, uh, that gives us technology, it gives us art, it gives us music, um, it gives us the everyday things that we have and that we use. Um, you know, somebody created the little bowl that I had my cereal in this morning. A lot easier than eating it out of the box, right? So creativity is a good thing. But it's not the meaning of life, which is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's a famous scientist and um, I think astronomer, studies space, he was once asked by um, a boy, a young man, what is the meaning of life? And Neil deGrasse Tyson's answer was, the meaning of life is learning. We are to learn our whole lives long and to keep on learning, and learning does not end when you finish school. 
Well, learning is certainly a good thing. It's good to know things and to be able to keep learning things your whole life long. But that's not the ultimate meaning of life. The ultimate meaning of life to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now, here's where those two things are smack dab in relation to what Paul wrote almost 2,000 years ago in his letter to the, to the um, Colossians. Because he said, you know, don't get carried away toward human philosophies and speculation if they don't point you to God. Here's what's wrong with what Mr. Zuckerberg and what Mr. Uh, Tyson had to say. What happens if a person is not creative or what if they are not learning? Does that mean that their life has no meaning? What about the infant in the womb? Are they creating anything? No, they're just growing, waiting for the day they'll be born. Are they learning anything? Well, probably not much at that point. Even when they're little, well, <laughs> they're not creating much other than a poopy diaper. What are they learning? Well, they're learning how to crawl and then to walk, yeah. But let's go to the end of life. What about someone who is at the end of life and is quite disabled and maybe is uh, bedridden? Are they creative? Are they learning anything? Does their life then have no meaning? And it's a short leap to go from no meaning to no value and from no value to disposable. Well, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I say no to that. <laughs> because even folks who need constant care, whether it be in a nursing home or at home or wherever they are, their lives have meaning and value. First, inherently, because they are created by God, created in God's image. So their value is not from anything they can do, it's just inherent. And the second thing is, their value is in what they're doing for us. If you've ever been a caregiver in a small way, just like changing a baby's diaper, not a big chore, or maybe in a bigger way caring for someone who has been uh, bedridden for a long time. What you are learning is the compassion and love and mercy of God and becoming more Christ-like in the process. And in those places around earth, the countries where assisted suicide and euthanasia are being practiced, their hearts are hard. And instead of learning the compassion, love, and mercy of God and becoming more Christ-like, they are slipping into the darkness of the demonic. And so while it is certainly good to be creative, it's good to keep learning things, ultimately that's not the meaning of life. The meaning of life is to love God and be loved by God, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Paul insists that human philosophies, they may look good on the surface, they may look lovely and be intriguing. Yeah, keep learning all your life long. That's a good thing. Yeah, it is a good thing. But they are empty and deceitful when they don't have God as part of the equation. And they stand in stark contrast to Jesus Christ, in whom the fullness of deity dwells bodily. You can learn a whole lot of things, but if you aren't learning along the way about God and about God's purpose for you and of God's love for you, it's going to be empty. And the purpose of education, the purpose of learning is to grow in godliness. That's what our friend John Calvin said. The question to ask about any explanation of the meaning of life is, does it have Jesus, the Savior, the Lord, as its center and as its focus?
Well, have any of you heard someone say, I'm spiritual but not religious? That was a common thing that people said for a while. And often those folks are exploring different faith traditions. They're trying different activities to try and get in touch with the transcendent God of the universe. But the problem with do-it-yourself religions is that ultimately they resist grace. Rather than living as a response to grace, these people in their efforts to grasp that grace under their own power, rather than simply receiving it. People ask Presbyterians and others, why do you baptize babies? Well, we baptize babies as well as adults because God's grace comes to us before we're able truly to respond to it, before uh, God always makes the first move. And when people are grasping for things without just receiving God's grace, then they are resisting God's grace. For followers of Jesus Christ, our human identity is located with our baptism, our adoption as God's children. Well, how sad it is that human beings go in so many ways rather than going God's way. And human sinfulness voluntarily submits to the forces of spiritual darkness. Yet God is loving and God is gracious. God puts to death those sinful ways at baptism. Now from the deadly drowning waters of baptism, God with mercy and grace raises God's baptized children to the life that is grateful obedience to God. A life that is alive to God's ways, to God's plans, and God's purposes. And maybe we know people that have been baptized and professed Christ and then wandered away. Oh, how sad that is, and yet we still trust God, that God is working in their lives and God will bring them back. After Paul wrote, we have been buried with Jesus in baptism and raised to life with him through faith. Paul wrote that we were once dead in our trespasses, in our sins, but we are now made alive with Jesus, having all our sins forgiven. Paul then wrote that God disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. The dark spiritual powers of sin have been defeated and put to shame. In the next verses, 16 through 23, we learn some of the more of the things that have been troubling the Christians in Colossae. There were some who were evidently looking down on their brothers and sisters who were not celebrating all of the holidays, or if they were Jewish Christians, maybe not keeping a kosher uh, diet. And Paul wrote, don't let anyone pass judgment on you for that. Some were being very strict in their fasting and were insisting that other people do that as well. Uh, they were worshiping angels, which is not allowed for Jews or Christians. And some were having mystical visions, which can be okay, but it is not necessary or essential for a follower of Jesus Christ to have them. And some of these having visions were, it seems, bragging about them. And that's just not helpful. Because those Christians in Colossae and we have the victory in Jesus Christ, it means that we are on equal footing with all of our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. So if you've never had a mystical vision, don't feel bad about that. You are equal to any of the other Christians in the world. Don't look down on them and don't feel bad that you don't have the same gifts, graces, and talents that they do. Well, all of these things I just mentioned were having the effect of drawing people away from Jesus Christ some people were being snobby. People were having their confidence in their experiences rather than having their confidence in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And these ones were not holding fast to the head of the church, 
who is Jesus Christ. Well, Paul wrote that all these things that people were doing that were drawing them away from the main thing, Jesus Christ, he said, you know, they have the appearance of wisdom, they're promoting a self-made religion and promoting asceticism and severity to the body, but they are no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. The kingdom of God brings meaning to our lives through the story of Jesus. His life is our life. His glory is our glory. Everything he did glorified the Father. Jesus shows us what wisdom and power really are. And Jesus does that by embracing an object that the Romans and other pagans considered shameful and foolish to embrace. And that is the cross. And on that cross, salvation was accomplished for us. And that's why we can sing about it. As we go out to live in this world sharing the love of Jesus Christ, we do so having encountered the living God here in our worship. That encounter, all the things we do on Sunday morning from the time the prelude music starts, Till the final blessing. That encounter, what we do here on Sunday morning or whenever we worship, is not a foolish withdrawing away from the world. That encounter is with the most real, meaningful thing there is, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that encounter is what gives us true wisdom, the wisdom that we need in order to love our neighbors and to love God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, if we are pulled away and enticed by anything that draws us away from our Savior, Jesus Christ, in your mercy, pull us back into his loving arms and keep our focus on him, on Jesus, our Savior, and help us to live with the love of Christ in all we do.